I would like to call to the podium Dr. Abebe Haile Gabriel, who is the Assistant Director General and Regional Representative for Africa at uh, the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations. Thank you, Dr. Haile Gabriel. And we will begin um, as we wait for Mr. Bitaye to join us, we will begin with a conversation um, that really will be more of a of a one on one. Dr. Abebe, thank you for for joining us here. You are a man with a, a storied career, uh, a lot of wisdom, knowledge, and technical expertise to share. I'm really excited to get to to share this this conversation with you. I'm really question uh, curious to hear from you. What is your vision of a successful governance? Uh, of food systems in Africa from both, and, and I'd love to hear both from your position at the FAO, but um, based on, on what you've seen on the continent. I think uh, governance issues are very key, very uh, crucial. And if there is um, one factor, uh, in my opinion, that has contributed to lack of success um, in terms of transforming the agri-food systems in Africa, um, we can ascribe it to lack of governance, the right kind of governance. So how do we understand it? Um, because we are talking also in, term, in the context of coordination, um, multi-level coordination, which means uh, we are talking about several stakeholders, actors, um, as well as uh, multi-sectors uh, when we look, look at within the government uh, approach. Uh, now, we have to identify the real uh, actors. In, in the African context, it is the uh, producers, the small producers, uh, the processors, those who in, in the logistic, in the agribusiness sectors, the consumers, and these are the majority. Uh, unfortunately, this majority, they can be characterized as weak in terms of their um, uh, negotiation power, in terms of their institutions. They are vulnerable to the different kinds of shocks, including policy shocks, uh, natural and man-made crisis. Um, and they are small in, in, in terms of many things, uh, and most importantly, in terms of resource endowments. Now, the kind of governance that will uh, make things happen for better for transforming agri-food systems should explicitly take into account these factors. It is about empowering this group of uh, stakeholders you talked about inclusivity and participation, but participation by itself, unless you are empowered, unless you own the agenda, it just becomes participation. Just like we participate in big meetings, we listen, we appreciate, we say this meeting is excellent. At the end of the day, who is going to take the action on the ground? So it's about ownership. We have to ask the right question. Who owns the agenda? And how does governance support or impede mm -hmm. change by, in terms of empowering the real actors? So the real actors in the food systems, it is across the whole value chain. We call it in, in, in FAO agri-food system value chain. Empowered actors is, is really a big core of your vision for, for this system. Um, I'm really pleased to, to note that Mr. Mamadou Bute is has joined us. Uh, he, please, I welcome you to the stage. Uh, Mr. Bite is the Executive Secretary at the, of the Africa Capacity Building Foundation. Um, I, I, and uh, I'm glad to see you've gathered your courage to come for the hot questions. <laughs> Um, it's wonderful to have you on stage. Let's start with you also. What's your vision for, for a successful governance of the food system, especially from that capacity building perspective? Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Wanjiro. When we talk about uh, uh, governance, uh, it takes really 
many dimensions and many uh, tools um, uh, to make that happen. Uh, but um, I believe that uh, two key ingredients are really uh, the people and the institutions. Uh, institutions play an extremely important role in, in, in governance. Um, and uh, uh, we can question uh, ourselves today um, whether um, the institutions we have uh, from a political point of view, uh, from a capacity building point of view, from implementation of policy, regulation, mobilization of finance, but also delivery of that, and et cetera, all the different uh, ingredients are um, fit uh, today for, uh, uh, to lead us to the realization of the ambition uh, that we that we have, and engendering uh, the type of tools and instruments and policies and regulations that allow to to, to make that happen. So um, it to me uh, affecting that by uh, really investing in the those two critical elements will be extremely important, and just to. Uh, to take example in the agricultural sector that we are talking about today, we talk about plants and uh, crops, plants. And to have really a good plant, you need two things, uh, a very good seed and a fertile soil. Uh, obviously other things, water, etc. But uh, to me, those are essential. And think about uh, the very good seed being the people who have the right skills, um, uh, the open mind, but who are also ready for mindset change uh, around how we look at agriculture, how we consider it. Uh, that is, for me, crucial to invest in. Uh, and also in the capacity to measure, uh, to learn, to do research, to generate insights, to inform through evidence uh, the instruments of governance. But it's also linkages between the different institutions. Sometimes we can see that there, could, there is some disconnect mm -hmm. uh, between the different institutions that participate in that governance. Mm -hmm. When you talk about really the high uh, uh, co continental institutions, uh, the regional level, national level, all the way to pharma um, uh, uh, organizations, and those actually in the, in the value chains. So to me, uh, really, if you talk about vision, it's really about uh, really building more uh, a knowledge society, particularly as it relates to food systems, uh, uh, not just agriculture, but all the other aspects that participate in it, uh, being at the forefront uh, or, or, or the cutting edge uh, of uh, innovation, enabling that, uh, and learning, and uh, uh, developing the right tools. But that will only work if you have that fertile soil, which are the conducive in institutions. Strong institutions, good seed, good soil, soil. and interconnection institutions. Yeah. It's part of your vision. Um, I'm going to move things a bit faster by asking double-decker <laughs> questions here now. Um, so that was just a, a big, big picture. Now we're going into the double-decker level. Um, one question is, what types of frameworks, underlying principles and values, do you think would underpin the efforts to set up successful governance of food systems on the continent? And really connected to that, how can we have effective multi-level um, coordination, evidence-based decision-making and inclusivity in food systems governance? So it's really what kinds of frameworks do you envision, um, do, we, do you think we need, and how can we have that effective coordination and decision-making? Uh, let me start with you, Dr. Uh, Haile Gabriel. I think the very good question, framework. There must be a purpose for doing anything. Um, 
and, and we're talking about food systems and governance, I can uh, speak of at least four uh, kind of pillars mm -hmm. to inform this framework. Because uh, the, the agri-food systems in Africa, um, it's not very efficient and therefore not productive, not comp competitive. Uh, it is not um, very inclusive. It's not resilient. Uh, it's not also sustainable. And therefore, uh, the purpose should be uh, to uh, promote production, uh, to promote um, nutrition, healthy diets, uh, to promote a better environment, uh, as well as better life in terms of agriculture really lifting uh, out of poverty the, magnet, the, the majority of the people. In, in FAO, we call it four betters, better production, better nutrition, a better environment and a better life, leaving no one behind. So it must have a purpose. <coughs> uh, the collaboration should focus on making it possible for the people, the real people who I spoke during the first round, to access important productive resources. And technology innovation is one of them. And this is one. Secondly, we keep talking about new initiatives, the Africa F continental free trade area. Agriculture is not really a priority if you just open the, the pages in, in, in that kind of discussion. Agriculture has always been neglected in Africa, even though on paper everybody is talking about prioritizing it. Okay, so how can we support the agri-food system actors to um, participate in real term in the emerging markets, market access? Uh, because that will also contribute not only to the competent, competitiveness, but also to the quality of products and therefore incomes of producers and the healthy, uh, the, the, you know, for the consumers to get uh, <coughs> healthy food uh, and so on. The third is about strengthening the institution. Um, um, my co-panelist has emphasized this. Institu institutions, it's very weak, as I said, and collective action, I think, is going to be the key. What do the farmers' organizations, the producers' organizations, the consumer associations, what do they look like at the moment? They're very weak. The fourth one is about finance, about investment finance. You may have heard, uh, I, I just came from Nairobi where the Africa uh, <coughs> Climate Summit took place. On average, the cost of borrowing to Africa is five times more than in developed countries. If you disaggregate it into America and in, in Europe, four times more than the US and eight times more than Europe. So if we borrow from international capital markets to invest in agriculture, paying on average five times more, how can we, how can our agri-food system deliver in terms of volumes, in terms of quality, and in terms of incomes of the poor? So it really requires, and, and governments in Africa, across the board, they are now suffering from fiscal crisis and balance of payment deficits. Debt is a key issue. Unless we speak of this kind of fundamental issues and reform the financial system to enable the producers and the agribusiness uh, agri actors to get access to finance, to invest, for the private sector to invest because private sector they need to make profit it's not you know philanthropy so it must have a purpose and we need to ask the difficult questions and find solutions that is only when we can make sense of talking about innovative approaches thank you so much uh my brother mr Bitte. uh thank you i i think that um i really support uh, everything that has been said. So to me, uh, I will ask another question. Uh, I think that the type of frameworks we should have, uh, the, that's a good description. Uh, but then the question is whether a framework is enough and then how do you utilize it uh, and how do you implement it in a coordinated way? Because it's not shortage of frameworks. Just this morning, uh, uh, Prime Minister Mayaki has been going through the journey about the different frameworks 
particularly uh, since uh, Maputo uh, 2003 to now that has been uh, 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 developed. Uh, and looking at all of these aspects. But uh, if we look at today, the level of implementation, uh, it's extremely very, very, very low. Uh, there is a, a study that was done, I think, by uh, Oxfam, uh, looking at, uh, called the State of the Union, looking at actually what is the level of implementation of decisions taken at the African Union. Uh, you would be surprised that's it below 15% uh, by member countries. So if you have, and it is really important to say, okay, once you have this framework, what do you need to make sure that actually it serves the purpose that he's been uh, talking, uh, talking about? And to me, a couple of things will be important. Uh, we talked about capacity to do that. So have the means of your ambition uh, is extremely important. Um, the political will is clear. We talk about it all the time. Uh, but I think that really understanding and taking the advantages uh, of coordination as well uh, is going to be extremely important. Because if we take really uh, the, the small countries that we have and the potential that we have that are very limited, uh, not taking coordinating and looking at how we produce across boundaries, how we do it two times a year, actually, across Northern Hemisphere and Second Hemisphere, because everything we do, we have the opportunity to do it twice within a year because of that, as we talk about the continent and looking at that vision, coordination, expanding, etc. Uh, it will be, uh, to me, difficult to attract, to have the viability and attract those resources uh, that are going to make a difference. Uh, so I think that really looking at, uh, once we have those uh, frameworks, what do we need to do uh, mm -hmm. to be able to actually implement them and make them serve the purpose, to me, is a very important question, actually, to, to talk to. I can see the fire is getting hotter. So I, I volunteer to jump in into this uh, conversation as well. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm very glad that, uh, you know, we are also cross-fertilization cross -fertilizing from among different sessions. I also was at the Ministerial Roundtable and when Dr. Mayaki talked about and gave us a historical context of the different continental frameworks and where we have come from and so on. Um, there are so many actors and Africa, I think, must be very special. I don't know if it happens in other regions, in other continents, if Asia or Latin America has several frameworks. It's not just one framework we have. You have the CADEP and others, but every institution, what's the name, comes up with a, a framework, an initiative. And our member states tend to jump the bandwagon without critically looking into it, without building on existing initiatives, without complement, considering the complementarity and the synergy aspect of it. And as a result, they are pulled apart from different directions. Today, it is one thing by one major kind of donor or, or, or uh, institution, tomorrow is going to be another. When we jump from one framework to another, we leave everything else. And how can we speak of governance, you know, if we are really not driving the process? The countries should own and drive the process. The role of international organizations and partners should be to support and complement the efforts of the, unfortunately in Africa, this is not the case in many, in many areas. Secondly, we need to question the narratives, the global narratives. As I said, you know, I just came from Nairobi and everybody's talking about Africa's contribution to climate emission, emission of greenhouse gases less than 4%. And then when it comes to agriculture, we say agriculture is the major emitter. Globally, yes. But in Africa, if the overall emission is just below 4%, how can we talk about agriculture contributing significantly to, uh, uh, to omission globally? The meaning of this, the purpose of this is that, you know, we have to transform our production and livelihood systems. And if we really reiterate saying that agriculture is contributing global emissions and therefore we have to reduce the emissions in Africa, what does it mean? 
So we have to question it. We have to customize it. We have to ask the right kind of question. Last, but, because this is about governance. Last but not, you may not even ask me follow-up question if you would, don't want. <laughs> I hope ministers are attending this meeting. Agriculture in Africa is supposed to be led by one ministry, Minister of Agriculture. Our ministers are on the same page as we are complaining about lack of finance for agriculture. Complaining that the government, meaning their ministers of finance, are not allocating enough resources to agriculture. They are complaining. This is no leadership. So in Africa, I think we need to <coughs> support the, those sectors, ministers of agriculture, fisheries, uh, forestry, livestock, and so on, to start a new conversation with their colleagues, ministers of finance, ministers of trade and industry, energy, infrastructure, and so on. Why not? With the office of the, minister, the prime minister or president to say that this is a real thing and agriculture, investing in agriculture pays off in terms of many, you know, com changing the macroeconomic variables for better. So we need to help them in terms of giving them the necessary data, showing them how some of the initiatives are re uh, producing results and there are results which we can share experiences among different countries so there is in my opinion a broken governance system in africa we need to move towards a core leadership co, co, co cooperation among various sectors when it comes to agri food system because it's a shared agenda it unites it's a unifying agenda agri food systems transformation sorry for taking a lot of time but i think this is very important I think you have brought exactly the heat that this fireside needed. I think, um, and actually in, in closing, in, I'm going to al allow me to go a little bit off script. Uh, I think you'll forgive me or beat me up later. <laughs> <laughs> um, but actually, I, I really love the passion with which you've spoken about this topic. And I am curious to hear from both of you. If you took your institutional hats off, you as African leaders who've been around the block and worked in many countries and have a perspective that many of us might not have, if we gave you a magic wand and we said, now here you go, the power of the ancestors is upon you, change this thing. What is one or two, what are one or two things you would do? First of all, where would you position yourself? Who do you think from a governance perspective has the most powerful lever? And that, so that's why you put yourself there. And what would you do? Uh, sorry. <laughs> this fire. fire is hot. The fire. In my, some of you know, in my previous life, I used to be at the African Union and uh, at the center of the Malabo Declaration. And <clears throat> you know the binary review, the clause in the declaration on binary review, as part of mutual accountability, we crafted it. There was a purpose to it. I will tell you how. It's a story. Ten years, no, eight years, seven years after, I visited a minister of finance in a country. And that minister asked me, Abebe, please do me one thing. Can you, FAO, can you please help me so that my president can receive a prize at the African Union summit as one of the best performers on Malabo? Mind you, it's not the Minister of Agriculture who's speaking. It's the Minister of, fi Minister of Finance. What is he asking more for, for support so that his country can be recognized for better delivery? You know, what we, we have in African Union gives every two years, recognizes uh, leaders for better performance on Malabo Declaration as part of the biennial review process. So that president wanted to be recognized you know why I'm telling you this? This is a real story. When we thought about putting that provision as part of Malabo, it was precisely to achieve this. 
which is to bring the agenda home, closer to the presidents. You know what the presidents don't like? When they sit together in a summit, they don't like one of them to be recognized, to be singled out and recognized. They consider, you know, they evaluate themselves. They feel ashamed. They travel with lots of media. And when one of them is picked and celebrated for bringing positive results in the country, they ask about themselves, how about me? I'm attending this meeting every time. It is another person. So the president now is asking. He's not just the Minister of Agriculture, but the Minister of Finance. Why are you putting me into this shame? Why can't we also? You see, that's why they ask me, FAO, can you please help me so that my president wins? I'm telling you this is the real story. So the one thing that I would do is to bring the issue of agri-food systems transformation as a priority agenda of the president. Because presidential initiatives get resources, get attention, get results. We have seen it. Thank you. Mr. Bite, the ancestors upon you, they have given you all the powers. How will you use them? First of all, I think that um, it's really important uh, to boost or to reinforce uh, the culture of accountability. Uh, because uh, to me, one important aspect of governance is also being able to measure uh, and uh, to hold oneself uh, accountable as well. And uh, 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 if we look at governance structures in the system, I mean, it's not just about food systems, agriculture, overall in general. Um, are we always having uh, the right sets of skills where we should have them? Do we have uh, the right systems of measurement and accountability? And do we enforce them? Uh, those are things to me that need to be looked at. The second thing is uh, uh, really uh, getting out of those systems where many of our governments are locked in uh, and are not able to get out from. Um, I do support uh, subsidies, uh, but subsidies are meant to be there for a certain time to enable, not every day. If I come from a country where uh, peanut is the main crop and it's very important for the government, ever since I looked at, I grew up, I've seen year on year in the issue of fertilizer seed subsidies to the uh, peanut groundnut sector actually being a major um, uh, priority for the government. Uh, extremely important resources are going to that. But the sector itself is declining, both in terms of productivity, in terms of production, and in terms of all the um, um, system that was around it, processing, uh, uh, jobs that were created and all of that are being depleted. So, uh, to me, why would you continue to do things, uh, the same thing and expecting a different uh, result? We need also uh, really to look more about what is working. We believe when we talk about finance, we always look at big uh, financial systems, big numbers. And oftentimes, smaller numbers make a difference. The power of savings led finance is extremely important. Uh, today, despite the many resources being invested by many governments, quality of seeds is not always there. The quality of fertilizer and their availability in time is not there, etc. But there are few uh, social entrepreneurs who is supporting farmers, for instance, save towards 
their agricultural input for the season. And through that, little by little, they say, based on the uh, land that they want to uh, and the crop they want to do at the next season. By the season, with the power of compounding everything together, they can get high quality seeds, they can get appropriate and bespoke um, uh, to their soils, uh, fertilizers, and way in time. And they are also supported uh, through uh, training, etc. Uh, this is not subsidy. It's providing a tool where you can, through your efforts, uh, really uh, save and uh, realize what you see. So the results of that, I just want to say this. Those have higher productivity, almost two times those who are not participating. But yet we are not looking at how do we take those, this is just one example of the type of successes that we have. How do we take them, amplify them, take them to scale and uh, give the opportunity to direct resources in other uh, places that actually need it. But we continue to do the same thing. So I think that is also about accountability. If you are keeping doing the same thing and not having the results that are expected. So this brings back to accountability. That is something probably I will definitely look at and concentrate on. Thank you. Thank you so much to our two fireside speakers. Allow me to invite the first uh, panel of speakers. Uh, we are going to start with Honorable Lambda Mamadou Sailu, Minister for Agriculture, Guinea-Bissau. Miss Elizabeth Swai, the CEO, AKM Glitters Company Limited in Tanzania and Akala alumni. Professor Joyce Kinabo, Professor of Human Nutrition in the Department of Food Technology, Nutrition and Consumer Sciences at the Sokoine University of Agriculture here in Tanzania. A round of applause for the, pro for the professor. <laughs> Dr. Joshua Ariga, Senior Program Officer at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Welcome to Dr. Ariga. Mr. Jacob Nyirongo, Akala alumni. Is Mr. Nyirongo with us? A round of applause. And Professor David Nyange, Chief of Party USAID Serabora Project. And if you don't mind, I'm going to stay up here. Um, and the challenge that I'm going to give you our panelists, is the fire that was lit. Add more firewood, fan the flames. Let them need to turn up the AC because of the fire you bring. I think we can agree on that. I've, I've also promised our speakers that I'm going to be a very mean moderator. I'm going to keep us on time, try to do my best to keep us on time. We don't want to... Um, miss the presidential session that's happening right after this. And so I will turn my mic on and off. And when I turn it back on, that's my, and then I was, I was also joking, I'm an African mother. And those of you who have African mothers know there's a look <laughs> an African mother gives you that causes you to repent your sins. <laughs> so I might throw that look to keep us on time. Let's get started. Um, uh, uh, prof, and, and I think we'll just do, it, do rounds of questions in this direction. So Prof, what do you th uh, see as the key components of food systems governance, and what role do you think food systems governance should play in food production, distribution, um, and access to ens ensure better food security outcomes? And it's really going to be the same question for, for all panelists. The key components of governance. Uh, thank you very much, uh, moderator and uh, organizers, for this opportunity. But before I move on to answer the question, I think people have been asking themselves, is, what's the link between agriculture and nutrition? And we are talking food systems. What is nutrition doing here? Uh, what I would like to remind you is that food systems manufacture nutrients and deliver them for human consumption. 
So they are lifelines for our survival and sustainability. Therefore, this meeting is about life. Life of plants, life of animals, life of trees, life of everything, insects. And these are the things that make our food. So if they are not given nutrients, these things die. So do humans will not survive. So food systems governance should strive to uphold the right of life of all these entities if we were to remain on this planet. So to answer your question about governance and the components, I think one of the components that is mentioned all over is about participation and inclusiveness. But participation here, I think uh, governance also is about learning. So if we talk about participation, it means that we have to learn from experts on food systems. I cannot claim here to be expert of food systems. Cla experts of food systems are women out there and farmers who are leaving the food systems. So we need to learn from them and then take appropriate actions. And this context, I would imagine having uh, artificial in intelligence. Now artificial intelligence here uh, can be used to give us information as to how we can respond appropriately to the issues of food governance at various nodes and various levels. So I'm looking at the use of data analytics, system learning in production consumption processing, personalized nutrition, and these will be necessary for us to be able to have collective understanding of issues uh, about food systems, but that need to be supported by quality data. Another issue is about connectivity. I think it was mentioned earlier on that people, there's inadequate connectivity, and this is because it's inadequately defined. Hence, there are challenges in providing good food um, system governance. So we need definition and establishment of communication channels. The internet is a super thing, but basically we haven't exploited it enough to be able to connect us in the endeavors of food systems transformation. But another area which I think is also critical is about governance capacity. Uh, this is a challenge in general, governance capacity in Africa, but it will be even more challenging with the food systems transformation. So what I'm saying here is that it would be very good for food system transformation. We need to build capacity of professionals to ensure that their professional skills on governance are enhanced so that they can deliver what we expect them to deliver. So in this regard, procedures for transforming skills around food systems into capacity and to produce better results are needed. So here we need new knowledge, new information, so that we can have this capacity for governance. And this is a very serious challenge in this continent as far as governance is concerned. Thank you so much. But another aspect of governance is Aki about- prof. <laughs> <laughs> Just one more minute Please. and I'll be done. <laughs> It's about uh, governance. We need to report back to our people. So here we are with all these uh, discussions. Who is going to let them know what has been going on in Dar es Salaam now? So we need to be accountable and go back and report all the recommendations that are emanated because those are the ones who would use this information to transform our uh, food systems. Alignment of sectors is another challenge, which uh, I think we'll come back to that later on. Thank you. As a, only because I'm a former academic. Otherwise, <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Harry. Yes. Hey, thank you so much. I'm going to change my discussion a little bit. Uh, I think we have had a very high level discussion, very broad issues. I like breaking things down to reality. 
how it lands on the ground. So I'm going to give two examples that to me reflects uh, the food systems governance. One, there was a question that was raised earlier, what drives all these different uh, stakeholders together? There has to be a purpose to bring us all together. I will start with a country-led vision where you have priorities at the country level, possibly by the Minister of Agriculture. And we know if you have a Minister of Agriculture person here, if you ask them for priorities, they are going to give you a hundred list, which is undoable. And, and it's, it's, it's understandable that, you know, as for example, for us as donors, when we speak, sorry, can you hear me? When we speak to the Minister of Agriculture, they want to help, so they leave you a list. So the first starting point is to prioritize that list. And it has to be evidence-based. We have a lot of institutions with models and uh, data analytics that can look at all those options, rank them out, and say, this is the number one option that can bring a lot of impact to the country. Because you, you want to identify where the impact is at the farm level, at the business level, and nationally. So once you identify those priorities now, it's a question of bringing the resources together. So again, starting from the Minister of Agriculture, and assuming it is maize we, we talk about, they, they, they look at the maize value chain. You have all the information about maize, the impact, and what needs to be done. Then you go to the Minister of Finance for allocation of funds. So uh, there has to be a sectoral coordination, Minister of Finance. I take the example of Tanzania, where they produce a lot of maize sometimes, and uh, there was some sort of restrictions on exports. And I think talking to Honorable Bashir at one point, he said, the minister said, we need to open up uh, the trade with Kenya and other countries. So as, as you look in a systems perspective, you don't look at one aspect. You think ahead and say, if the farmers overproduce, how do we sell it to the other countries? So you look at trade policies, you look at the, the, in a holistic way. So that is the simplest way of looking at this. And also now you bring in the private sector because implementation of these aspects is about the, uh, the private sector and, and the farmers. But I'm going to pull away from that aspect again and look at uh, how do we make it more complex. A farmer is not a single value chain grower. All farmers have different crops and livestock. So if you take an example of a, a county in Kenya, for example, or a district in Tanzania, and you look at a typical area where you now prioritize among a cluster, a cluster of value chains, and say farmers in this area are focused on, on these main clusters of value chains, and then you do some analytics. And again, you provide evidence in terms of if we were to improve production, what would the effect be? How much money would be required into this? Look at the government resources again and, and the donor financing and bring all that aspect together. In that way, you're bringing together the stakeholders to a common purpose. But if you are bringing different uh, investments from different you know, partners that are not coordinated, then that impact at the country level is very difficult. So I just wanted to bring this down to uh, because I've listened to the very high level discussion about food systems, which I, I, you know, I didn't want to repeat, just to bring it to the practical aspect. So I just give you that example, I can provide uh, specifics as we move forward. Thank you so much. Uh, Mr. Nyirongo. Thank you, moderator. My name is Jacob Nyirongo. Um, I'm an, a Kala alumni. Uh, Kala is a center for African leaders in agriculture. And uh, I had an opportunity to participate in this uh, uh, AGRA program, where the purpose of the program is to develop leaders across Africa to lead uh, agri-food systems transformation in their own countries, uh, in their own regions. Uh, so it was quite uh, an inspiring journey for me to be part of that um, uh, important program. Uh, during the fireside, is it fireside? Uh, discussions, uh, Dr. Uh, Mr. Mamadou uh, talked briefly about the, the frameworks and uh, what are the kind of important um, parameters or pillars that we need to, to look at when we are talking about agri-food systems governance. And one of the interesting areas that he talked about was people and institutions. And I think this is very, very important. It was a very important point because for us as African countries to shift from doing business as usual and start aligning to the new definition of how we address issues to do with uh, uh, nutrition challenges, to do with climate challenges, 
to do with environmental degradation. It requires mindset shift. It requires new skills. And uh, it requires a new set of skills. Uh, and so the color program is really focusing on the people skills, how leaders can have a new orientation in terms of how they, they look at advancing food systems, but also what kind of institutions should we have at the country level, at the regional level, and at the Pan-African level that can help us to drive food transformation, food system transformation. Um, it's important to, um, uh, to take note that uh, it's just two years ago when we had the inaugural UN Food System Summit. And um, different countries, I think, are there at different levels in terms of trying to align to the new thinking. Um, I know uh, Minister of Agriculture have been, the ministers of Agriculture have been the major the, the conveners in the country. Um, there's still a lot of work in terms of ensuring that there is alignment um, of our domestic policies to the Pan-African agenda around agri-food system. And um, it takes time to align. But also, if you look at, uh, at, at, at having food systems that can deliver for people, climate, and nature, you see that the diversity of stakeholders is quite broad. And to have consensus and have one message and one definition or one vision on food systems, it can be quite a challenge. Um, so you have, for example, those that are driving climate solutions. Uh, now people are talking about agriculture as the, one of the major contributors to greenhouse gases. And they are bringing solutions that are actually in conflict with farmers that threaten uh, livelihoods of thousands of, of Africans. Um, you might have heard about uh, groups that are, are, are pushing for uh, lab meat, so produce a chicken in the lab. And what implications does that have on, on small producers in Africa? Um, and then, it's, 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 it's uh, I, I think, so balancing between the different groups, the small-scale farmers, uh, the mat nationals, uh, it sometimes can be uh, quite a challenge. There was a point by Dr. Abebe, I think, when he talked about um, um, the vulnerable, the, the thousands of farm, small-scale farmers across Africa, and how to tap into their wisdom in terms of how should we advance, uh, what does food system mean for them? Um, as farmers, I, I work for Farmers Union, and, and um, sometimes we face a lot of shifts in terms, uh, like for example, you, you, you'd hear concepts around regenerative agriculture, agroecology, uh, climate smart agriculture. There are elements of the same, but different, and so to navigate through different concepts that are always coming up, it can be quite a, a difficult undertaking. But uh, to answer your question, I think... <gasps> uh, that wasn't the answer? <laughs> it was. <laughs> it, <laughs> it was an answer. <laughs> Okay, please finish your sentence. To summarize, I think one of the components in, in governance for food systems, I think what is critical is people and institutions. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Prof, over to you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Jerongo. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, as I've been introduced, um, I lead a policy project here in Tanzania, funded by USAID, uh, implemented by Michigan State University and uh, Aspires, which is a local NGO. So I've been in this uh, arena of policy 
and governance in the food systems for over 10 years now. So I'll share a little bit of experience. Uh, I would like you to start by looking at the nexus uh, between uh, governance and the policy, especially in the food systems. Um, there's uh, empirical evidence which shows um, that um, good governance could lead to better policies. And better policies, and, and good policies could lead to better uh, food systems outcomes in terms of you know, improved uh, and quality diet, you know, nutritious food, uh, you know, addressing malnutrition, as well as improving uh, food security. Uh, and uh, I'll set a few examples. Um, yeah, this research work that shows uh, that countries which were highly ranked in the doing business survey by the World Bank, they also scored highly uh, in the governance, in the independent governance surveys. And more specifically to the food systems, um, in 2012 and 2020, uh, our project collaborated with another USD funded project called uh, Policy Link. And we conducted what is known as policy institutional architecture, in which we were assessing the quality of policy reforms in the food system, uh, looking at five broad uh, criteria. Uh, one on the you know, policy framework, looking if it's an ex reforms are done within existing uh, policy framework. Um, looking at coordination and inclusion, um, looking at um, uh, whether the, the, the reforms were evidence-based, um, looking at actual implementation, because you may have a policy there, but not be able to implement it, and eventually the mutual accountability that has been spoken by previous uh, speakers. And in the course of eight years, we see quite a significant improvement in the overall uh, performance uh, of Tanzania. That's reflecting uh, improvement in the quality of policy reforms in the food systems. And concurrently, we saw also improvement in some of the food systems outcome. For example, decrease uh, in the percentage uh, of stunted children and of course, for the first time, we observed also that percentage of households uh, below the food poverty line for the first time was able to, uh, to, to, to decrease up to single digit. So you can see that, that close link. Another area which I would also to talk about is the issue of inclusion. Uh, most of us in the development, you know, development practitioners, uh, we have a very systematic reporting system you know, based on the results framework. So whenever we implement activities, you know, we tend to count yeah, the participants and say, okay, we have this percentage of women, this percentage of children, and we think uh, we have achieved that inclusion. But you need to go beyond that. As we are, as, a, as part of the technical team that helped to develop, uh, you know, the building better tomor uh, tomorrow, the, youth agribusiness strategy, which was launched this morning. And we had an opportunity to reflect, uh, you know, what are the really binding constraints to youth participation in agriculture? And what are the policies that would help uh, to address that situation? And we came up with four or five major constraints. One's inadequate skills, uh, you know, challenges in access to land, access to finance, and of course, access to markets. But maybe just picking one or two as an example. We looked, for example, access to land. And we looked at the national surveys, uh, agriculture survey. And we identified that the key main sources of farmland is first is through inheritance, which is a very common practice in Africa, uh, land leasing, and of course, purchasing land. And then we looked at these ca three categories. Which categories youth are likely to participate in land acquisition? And probably, you may guess, is land leasing. 
And so as we are interacting with youth, we are complaining that, you know, uh, they don't have enough capital to purchase land. And we said, you know, you don't need to start by purchasing land. You may lease land. You know, if you wanted to start a barber shop, you know, you don't start constructing a building or purchasing a property. You just lease a room, you start a barber shop. So likewise, you can just lend a, lease a piece, a small piece of land, start with your horticultural crops. But then we looked at the regulatory framework. What we observed is that the legal and regulatory framework for land tightening, but not land leasing. So this is the work that we are currently work, doing uh, with my project, looking, uh, you know, trying to bring international regional best practices on land leasing. Uh, what are the best practices and what needs to be done? Uh, collect a sample of these uh, contracts for land leasing. Uh, convene uh, legal experts on land issues and hopefully to come up with one which will reflect the best practices and then identify an opportunity for establishing a legal framework for land leasing. So maybe I should stop there by then. I think the professors know I have a soft spot somewhere. Um, thank you so much for that. Um, in, in, in light of, uh, of, of time, I'm actually going to do now a, a double-decker round. So I'm, I'm going to come back to you, to, to each one of you, and ask you, why is policy coherence so crucial, and how can we better align among the various sectors, ministries, governmental levels, to address the challenges that we're facing? And I'm also going to bring forward a question that I asked to the speakers of our fireside. Again, here I am, almighty, I've given you all the powers to change one or two things in food systems governance. The power is in your hands. What would you do? What one or two things would you do and from where? And that question is really aimed at having you tell us where do you see the most potent levers for transformation from a governance perspective sitting. So let's do that as, uh, as really your closing, closing words. And, and uh, for my fellow Swahili speakers, let us not put out the fire. So in your closing words, please keep the fire burning. Prof. We'll start with you again. Alignment. Uh, that's a big challenge in this uh, continent. Uh, one thing we need to remember is that, uh, you know, this is food systems, there are no sectors there. Uh, in a food system, you see continuum of activities, of actors, and all things happen at once. There are no segments. So when we talk of alignment and bringing sectors to, uh, it's the governance that has uh, brought these sectors into play because we want to have uh, institutions and sectors to look at one or two things in this uh, area. So what I'm trying to say here really is not a question of an alignment. I think it's convergence. One sectors to converge at the try to solve problems that exist in this, um, in this um, food systems. Now, convergence means that you bring your, your tools. So we should go there as a toolkit or service kit that Minister of Agriculture would be like probably providing a hammer, another one providing a sped, another one providing a nail. So we don't expect that one sector would have answers for all these issues that we have as far as food system transformation. So let's go for that kind of approach of going there as a van of services to solve problems related to food systems. So we require several tools from various sectors who would come together and help us solve the, pro the problem. So if I were to do one thing at this juncture, as far as food systems transformation is concerned, I think is to change our mindset and thinking about food system. Where do we start? Do we start from the consumption part or do we start from the production part? 
I would imagine that we can be more effective if we start from the consumption part, to know exactly what is needed. We have a population, how much iron is needed for each individual in this country, and how much can we produce, and which crop can provide us the iron that is needed in our diet, and work back to the land to see how we can produce that, so that we don't just plan to produce and not meeting the requirements for nutrients for the entire population. So mindset and thinking, I think, would be one of the issues that I would work on it. Thank you very much. I don't know about other people, but I've never thought about it that way. Start from how much iron do we need, and then work backwards. Thank you, Prof. Dr. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, now, uh, it has taken us a while, even at the foundation, to sort of strategy, change strategies, and adapt to changing conditions. And I think your question is important in terms of how do you align not only with the government, and the willingness of the government is very, very important. You can do as much as you want individually, but you might have impact on a very narrow set of either farmers or certain uh, segments of society. But if you work with the government together, that, be that becomes more scalable. So a country-led sort of development where at the beginning, identify where the key players are and their interests. People have different varying interests. The government has varying interests. Their private sector has also some interests and farmers. So that initial assessment where you create the purpose, I think is very important to be inclusive as much as you can of the key segments of society. And once you identify that now, it's a question of bringing the resources together towards that. And you can bring in government and donors and other others together. So the initial assessment, I think bringing people together, bring other uh, uh, the farmer organizations also to understand what they want, private sector and the international organizations. But to your point, I think one of the most frustrating things uh, for a lot of work that we do in development is when governments change. So you have done some good work with the Minister of Agriculture to a point, and then the government changes, you have somebody else coming in the ministry, and then they start their own prioritization. And also there are some other things that were being done before that could be helpful to continue moving forward. But you find probably the minister has a different uh, view of what they want to do. So I think continuity is very important for government as well. So how do we continue some of the things that are working very well across regimes of government? Is, uh, for me, that, 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 that would be very crucial. So I will stop there, but also just emphasize one thing that evidence is very important. Just get providing evidence-based prioritization where you know the impact on different segments of society and then you can bring the resources to bear there. Thank you. So you're using your magic wand for continuity? Continuity of the good things that have been done in the past. Fantastic. Mr. Nyirongo. I think policy alignment is a critical factor, but very difficult to achieve, uh, both at uh, country level, but even when you're talking about domestication of continental instruments. Um, on Tuesday, I attended the um, parliamentary forum where His Excellency uh, President Kikweti uh, talked, up to, uh, talked about the um, FCTA, F, FTA, that uh, we still have countries that haven't ratified. And, and, and that shows um, the difficulty that comes with domestication, alignment, and even at country level, especially when we are talking about food systems, you are talking about intersectoral coordination, and that can be quite difficult to achieve when you are, when you are looking at policy reforms. Um, one, because of leadership. I think agri-food systems in most countries are led by ministers of agriculture. And sometimes it can be challenging for principal secretaries of agriculture to convene a meeting where other permanent secretaries have to sit. Do you have power to convene? I think those are questions um, and uh, sometimes barriers because of the power play between peers. But it's a critical thing to align policies, otherwise you cannot progress. I think looking back, I think you asked a similar question to the uh, to Dr. Abebe and uh, Mr. Mamadou. 
and I would like to agree with Dr. Bebe when he talked about maybe the leadership should be at a higher level, maybe in the office of the president. And that's when you can make things happen. In Malawi, for example, we have the presidential delivery unit. And the purpose of that presidential delivery unit is to look at what are the policy barriers? How can we quickly tackle them so that we can make progress? So to answer that question, I think uh, let's push the leadership of agri-food system transformation to the highest level. Thank you. Yes, I would like to touch maybe three things quickly. Uh, policy uh, predictability, uh, policy coherence, and finally the political economy. Uh, on policy pro predictability, I see sometimes there's misinterpretation. Some people think policy predict predictability means uh, not implementing reforms. But basically, policy predictability means implementing reforms according to the expectations of the stakeholders. Uh, for example, in the US, we have been see seeing the federal government you know, raising the interest rate. And the stakeholders expect continued increase in the interest rate. So that's it. there are reforms, but in a predictable way. So uh, predictability does not mean absence of reforms. And reforms tends to, to be a continuous process. But because of lack of time, I cannot give much example on that. Now, on policy coherence, I would say uh, lack of policy coherence undermines uh, policy implementation. And I'll use one example, which probably is common across Africa. Uh, there's a dichotomy in the processing industry in Africa. We have these large processing plants, food, uh, food processing plants, usually located near the port. It could be plants that rely on importation of raw vegetable oil for refinement and distribution, or importation of powdered milk for re reconstitution, packaging and distribution, uh, or wheat or any other product. And at countryside, we have these medium scale processors that source their raw materials uh, from the smallholder farmers. Uh, so these are two different stakeholders in the same industry. So the importers usually would lobby for free market uh, because of course they are addressing food inflation uh, and, and, and so forth, especially now during the global uh, you know, food, price, uh, food price crisis. And then the upper country processors would claim that the importers are exporting uh, the local jobs. <laughs> they, are they are sourcing from the farmers. So what has been happening is that the policymakers are usually swayed between in making decisions between these two groups. So in year one, they would raise import tariff to protect the local pro processors. The following year, another group comes strongly and they will reverse uh, the reforms. So how do you deal with that? So you need a common framework. And usually through most of the cases, we develop subsector strategies where you bring them together for a common strategy that, you know, this is our path, you know, 10 years down the road. We started to this stage, gradually raise the import tariff to protect the local producer temporarily, but then creating an enabling environment to enhance the competitiveness. And finally, the political economy, which I think is a very sensitive uh, issue in Africa. What we have realized in every policy, there's a political economy around it. So mapping stakeholders and identifying their interests is very, very important for successful uh, policy reforms in the food systems. Thank you very much. You have brought, brought brilliance, tactical advice, and wisdom um, and vision to, to this panel, and we thank you for that. I invite you to uh, take your seats. Um, and as I welcome to the stage the second uh, and final panel that we have for this conversation, Policy Symposium, I'd like to invite Ms. Safia Boli, the Executive Director of the African Agricultural Transformation Initiative, to join us on stage. Um, 
Dr. Elida, uh, Ms. Elida Kazira, the Director of Crop Development, Ministry of Agriculture, Malawi. Please join us on stage. Thank you. Do we have Ms. Sarah Mbagombunu, Director of East and Southern Africa Division of IFAD with us? Ms. Sarah Mbagombunu? Uh, Dr. Apollos Nuanfo, uh, Vice President Policy and State Capacity at AGRA. Please do join us on stage. Do we have Mr. Amadou Moktaba with us? Mr. Amadou Moktaba? Um, and finally, last but not least, Dr. Dabisi Araba, who is a visiting lecturer at Imperial College London. Please do join us on stage. Welcome, and I think I, I, I think you've seen my style now. Uh, so as as we keep uh, track of time, and I see they've they've even pos positioned the police right in my line of sight. So. I have an exit path this direction, uh, but uh, I think it would be wonderful if we can just stick to time and keep our answers wonderfully concise. We have a lot to learn from your wisdom and expertise. And so let's get right into it with, uh, and, and I think what I'll do is again, ask a first question and then a second question will be a double decker one. Um, let's start, and if we may please start with you, Ms. Bolly, and, and proceeding in that way. What is the significance of engaging diverse stakeholders, including farmers, consumers, businesses, civil society, and academia in food systems governance? And, and really, how can we ensure that we have a holistic and participatory approach? There you go. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Wanjiru, for this opportunity. Earlier during the fireside chat, and also from uh, a few uh, of the first panel as well, we spoke a lot about accountability, about uh, strengthening institutions. So I have the pleasure to say that we launched a couple of days ago the Agricultural Transformation Office in Tanzania, which is meant to essentially respond to those strengthen government institutions and create uh, evidence and knowledge-based decisions. Now, going back to the, the aspect of policy formulation, policy governance, and inclusive participation on this, I would argue that a policy is only as effective as the impact that it achieves. So lots of studies, lots of discussions, lots of aspirations, but if we are not looking at the impact of it and very much making it practical, I feel we have uh, missed the, the opportunity there. So several uh, studies have uh, shown us that reaching that impact is not that easy. More recently, uh, IFPRI did a model, um, the RIAPA model, which is the Rural Investment and Policy Analysis model, which for the case of Tanzania concluded that no single value chain will help the government in achieving reduction in hunger, uh, alleviation of poverty, growth in the, in the sector, job creation, and improved diets. So there is a need to do a trade-off, there is a need to choose specifically which ones are the most catalytic. But that choice and that decision cannot be done without the ones that are implementing it. So in the case of Tanzania, the Minister of Agriculture asked us to give him an agricultural master plan that is more practical because he feels that as the broader frameworks that we have, the over strategies that we do contain a level of ambiguity that when it comes to evaluation as a political person also accountable to the citizens of Tanzania for agricultural delivery and transformation, when it comes to assessing performance and seeing really what impact has been made, if you're working within level of ambiguity in the policies and decisions, it's quite uh, challenging. So we have gone into a listening tour. We've established a working group with the government, uh, the th three subsectors, crops, livestock, and fisheries, to understand some of the challenges that have uh, occurred in the past and how we can further deepen that diagnostic. But in addition to listening to the government, we have spoken to smallholder farmers. At the end of the day, all the aspiration we have will have to be driven and in implemented by them. So it's always for the smallholder farmer, what is in it for me? How would I change my, my livelihood today? 
how can I graduate from sustenance production to becoming an entrepreneur? So in the absence of that bottom-up approach in policy formulation and assessing the, the impact of them, I feel that we only have aspirations, we have lots of studies, but we, we can build a nice governance around them, but it would not necessarily achieve the impacts uh, we're looking for. So our listening tour has taken us uh, already with the uh, fisher folks, with pastoralists, and also with the uh, uh, farmers for crops also. But one of the key elements that come out is that not only do they want to be more informed about it, more aware of the changes, but they want to be part of the policy formulation. And when the policy is formulated and promises are made, aspirations are, have been expressed, and hope is created uh, within that population, um, when it comes to checking where things have been done, they also want to be part of it. So one of the elements we will be strengthening is also the governance mechanism. And you know that through the Dakar 2 summit, Tanzania has signed uh, a food compact that will be monitored through the Food Agricultural Delivery Council. Our Agricultural Transformation Office will support that with evidence-based uh, uh, decision-making, but would also ensure that it has farmers' representation. Again, coming back to the inclusiveness, thank you. Thank you so much. Miss um, Kazira. Yeah, thank you very much. I think um, uh, for me, I will not go into explanations because there have been a lot of explanations on the governance, on the policies, and on everything. I don't think I can give any better explanation to those ones. So I will just go straight to responding to why should we engage. I think it's very important that we should be engaging because as we are saying that the food system is a complex thing, we have to engage at all levels because food system is a complex thing, it's very complicated. So if we leave some people out, it means they are left out forever and the, the governance we are talking about, the policies we are talking about, it means in the end they will not be good policies or good governance, they, they won't be good governance because some people will be complaining. So we have to take on board the private sector, the public, the farmers, all levels, at national level, local level, global level. That's how we, we are supposed to handle these food systems. Mm -hmm. So to me, it's let's engage, let's coordinate, let's take action together, let's do everything together in order to achieve this transformation in the food systems. Thank you. Swift and to the point. Just hold on to the mic for the next round. Dr. Apollos. We're just trying to build on what the earlier panels have said. Um, uh, engaging stakeholders is important, but let's take a look back as to the fundamentals of that. Um, in the governance of, of food systems, um, you want to place the governance on a three-legged stool made up of transparency, accountability, and participation. You know, so as looking at it from that perspective, then that, you know, sort of uh, gives you the fundamental reason why stakeholders should be engaged in the policy making. Because you see, like I think someone said earlier, the, the beauty of a policy, it's in the impact it makes, the results that we're able to measure not necessarily in the beauty of the document, uh, you know. Uh, so, so I think we need to think about that. And to be able to measure results, you want to know what, what sort of results are going to make that kind of impact, which is why stakeholder engagement is important. That's one. Second is, with, is the fact that without stakeholder engagement, you're not going to get accountability. Uh, and the reason why you won't get accountability is because as much as you're making the policy, you need those who leave the realities of that policy, you know, to be able to say, look, here's what we're going through. You know, here's what's happening. Uh, and I, I remember um, uh, when I used to work, um, uh, I used to look at the governance of water resource management, you know, um, for irrigation purposes and all that. And we used to ha have engagements with the river basin authorities. Um, one of the things we went to a community and said, hey guys, you know, you're supposed to grow, what do you do and all that. 
And in the course of the discussion, what came out as priority number one was that they wanted a religious building, first of all. They said, one, give us a mosque, two, give us water for, for irrigation, and then three, give us uh, um, uh, you know, uh, a place where we can sit in the evenings you know, to, to discuss our matters in this community, right? So during the course of that stakeholder in engagement, that helps you to understand why a policy is not necessarily being implemented. Because there's usually a huge gap between policy making and implementation. You know, uh, a third uh, reason that we must understand is the fact that, you know, policies have to be implemented. And the way policies are implemented is to back it up with financing. And that comes in budgets or, you know, uh, uh, you know, or what development partners will give us aid. So when you see a budget, it's the figurative expression of a policy that's been prioritized. Without a stakeholder engagement, you're probably not going to be to understand what are you financing. You know, so you could have a budget line that says we're going to do this. And people say, look, I, I don't understand what you're doing. Where, where, where is this coming from? So understanding the fact that before you even get to the financing, that stakeholder engagement helps you to understand what exactly that policy should prioritize and, you know, what you're going to finance. So when you look at the budget, you're seeing a prioritized policy. And that then helps you to understand that, uh, you know, you can demand accountability as you go forward. You can ensure that there's going to be proper engagement in the delivery of that food systems program. And that you're sure that when the results do come out, there's a shared ownership of those results. And, and that's what's important. I'll leave it there. Fantastic. Dr. Araba. I'll start where, where my dear brother Apollos ended, shared ownership. Success has many friends. And I think if we want the food systems transformation process to succeed, it needs many friends. I see food systems, or the, the sort of metaphor I, I would like to uh, propose is looking through a kaleidoscope. When you look through a kaleidoscope, you see the multiple colors, different shapes, and different actors involved in food systems should see themselves reflected in food system strategies, plans, policies, etc. Not just for not not just through the engagement process and for accountability, but most importantly for ownership. Because different actors can shift over time. We've just heard that you know changing political actors can shift the entire ground uh, from beneath your feet. But if there are more actors or more partners involved in ownership. I would say you are diversifying or de-risking um, uh, the failure of transformation if any single partner moves away. We all saw in 2020, 2021, when national governments made the drastic or took the drastic actions of closing borders uh, and stopping or dislocating um, uh, supply chains, it was a political decision without consulting other food system stakeholders. And that led to chaos, not just at the local level, but globally, that we are still trying to recover from. So that is the very you know, definition of why we need all these friends. So I, I, Wanjiru, I think the, the answer has been, you know, we, we, we provided the answer here. It's important to have all these stakeholders. It's important for, you know, through the engagement process, it's important for accountability. But it's most important, I think, for ownership. And if we have multiple friends, or if it has multiple stakeholders holding this thing and seeing themselves reflected, perhaps another analogy would be looking at a mirror. You look at a mirror and multiple stakeholders see themselves as part of what it takes to make food systems succeed. Then they fight for it. So it doesn't necessarily rest on the shoulders of a political or political governments uh, alone and exclusively. Thank you. Thank you so much. There's so much that's coming out of this panel. I almost wish we could have the two panels speaking to each other. Because when I hear you saying it needs many friends, then I hear someone else recommending this needs to be a presidential initiative in the office of the president. It's an interesting juxtaposition between those two governance, proposed governance approaches. I really wish we could, we could have had almost a, a, a debate 
uh, between the two panels. Um, but and, and I also want to appreciate how fast you're answering the questions because it's going to give us an ability to get into even more. Um, so if you could, uh, uh, again, please just keep it concise. I'd love to get to three questions if we can. Um, talk to us about the value of evidence-based decision making in um, formulating effective policies. And if I could tag that with a question around avenues for strengthening international cooperation uh, amongst countries to address the kind of global level food security. We know we've got a national government representative, but the three, the, the other three panelists, you're working at, at that global, at least multinational uh, level. Um, please talk to us about evidence, the value of evidence-based decision-making. And if you can bring in that global country cooperation piece, that would be helpful. Ms. Bollett, please. I think coming back to the idea of being able to remain practical, realistic, but also true to what you have uh, uh, promised, aspired to, evidences and data that are not only collected in a sanitized manner, so in a structured manner, but have been also tested and verified is the backbone of the continuity for uh, transformation. Food systems transformation requires three things. It needs a champion, so a single political individual, president, whichever is the strongest power to drive it through the transformation. It requires tools and methodologies to do that. You cannot just do it in a vacuum. And it requires to be in control of the entire environment that needs to be transformed. So usually this is why people say it should be at the president's level. So this is how you could drive it. Among the tools and methodologies is not only having the understanding of how you're going to implement it, so come to the very practical aspect of things, but being able to assess whether you have achieved your target. The challenge we have very often in the countries, and, and Tanzania is not any different from that in terms of other, other African countries, is challenges with data. Where is the data? How can we collect it uh, accurately? How could it continue to inform our, our decisions? And the absence of that is really the major uh, hurdles. For an agricultural uh, transformation plan, you not only need to start building that framework for data collection and reporting. And it's not a single actor's process. The data that you're providing in the ministry should speak to the data in the World Bank, in FAOs, and in other parts, and all the stakeholders. The private sector should be able to look in, into it and also understand uh, its way forward. So the major challenge is how do we synchronize this evidence, but also if after we have the evidence on the impact, how do we have single messaging? We have incoherent messages incoherent messages from development partners, private sector and government stem often from uh, divergence in impact. And that divergence is created by the lack of evidence. So this is where the value of evidence uh, comes into play. And a way of subsequently triggering international cooperation, international trade through that is really a bit of transparency in the data as well. Um, national political leaders want to be accountable to their uh, citizens, somehow protect smallholder farmers in that discussion, want to make sure that it's only when they have graduated to be entrepreneurs that we open the doors and that other entrepreneurs would not come and, and uh, uh, crush them uh, in a way. So that openness depends on the transparency, but also the, the ambitions of uh, individual uh, nations as well. I will stop here. Thank you, Bonjour. I know the double-decker questions are hard because there's a lot, but please. Yeah, evidence-based uh, policies, they are very, very important. We really need evidence-based evidence -based policy making decisions. Uh, as my colleague here has rightly said, the challenge that we are having is uh, the challenge of data. Uh, the data we are getting maybe is incomplete to inform the policy, to uh, give the evidence that is required for the policy. And uh, the end result of that incomplete data 
is that the policies that we are having uh, may be biased towards a certain uh, sector, a certain group of people, a certain, um, uh, yeah, a certain community or a certain political uh, party. So we need good data. We need to start uh, collecting good data that will uh, make us have the evidence that we want to inform our policies. Uh, for example, uh, uh, like if you, maybe we are talking of nutrition, or oh, what we are hearing is that we uh, uh, indigenous crops they are good at uh, nutrition, but we have been with the uh, indigenous crops for a long time. But why is it coming now? It means somewhere we lacked the data, we lacked the evidence. So we need evidence to come up with. We need the data, correct data, real data, to come up with the uh, policies that will uh, take us and transform our food systems. Otherwise, what we have been doing, it means we'll be repurposing or changing our policies now and then and you will not see the impact of the different policies. So I agree with my colleague here that we need good data to come up with the evidence-based policies that will, uh, for, or that will impact the future or the transformation of the food systems. Thank you. Let me tell you a story, Wanjiru, and of course, the rest of the colleagues here. A um, short one, eh? eh? A short one. I'll, I'll try. I'll try. So it's about, and, and I would like to use, um, you know, of course, uh, Tanzania as a real life example. Um, sometime in 2019, um, I sat with um, colleagues uh, from, from within the office and we're looking at a program um, on policy action. Um, and it was because we began to rethink, because one of the things we've seen in Agra is our governments make you know, uh, demands. Uh, the government has a demand, and, and, and those demands are, are legitimate because they want to transform their countries, right? Um, but those demands are based on, you know, the political wind that blows. So the president goes to a, a, a province or, or a county or a region to visit some people, and then you find a, a, the people saying, we elected you, you must do this. You must. And then he comes back, he says, okay, I want X, Y, Z to happen. But the challenge with that was that there was no data and evidence to back those requests or to prioritize them. So you have a long wish list, which, is, which even got reflected in NAIPS, the National Agricultural Investment Plans. You know? So you find the NAIPS are like, you've got 101 things sitting there in the NAIPS and then everyone is asking, how do you implement? So what did we do? We, with support from BMGF, we set up what was called, or what is now called, the Hope for Agricultural Policy Action. And it's to look at policy consolidation and translation. Why? Because even when the evidence is there, there was an inability to consume that evidence and make a decision. So which was why we set that up. And what did we do? What you now know as BBT in Tanzania, what you now know as the Tanzania uh, agro-industrialization program was, was because of a number of things we did to provide evidence and data. So we went, we went back um, and we did that across. But for the example of Tanzania, we, we sat down with the government and said, what is it that you want? And they shared with us their vision. We looked at the ASDP2 or the ASDP1, the Agricultural Sector Development Plan, which is their naive. And we said, okay, we're coming back. We went back and sat down and reviewed the, the, the wish list, prioritized it based on data and evidence that we mined. And it was what informed what you now know as BBT, which is being launched. I, some of you who were there this morning, you see that the, the uh, um, you know, development partners have committed, the World Bank has committed over $200 million to that project. AFDB, AF, uh, the African Development Bank has committed to the uh, uh, the Tanzania industrialization flagship. So when we look at how we bring evidence to the table, it attracts partnerships. 
even at the global level. Because people want to know exactly what they are paying for, what they are buying. What am I buying here? Am I just buying a set of um, you know, political statements or am I buying a program that will deliver results? And the key to attracting the right customers to buy these programs is evidence and data. Because what it does is that it then says, okay, here's how this feeds into your results or your overall strategic objective as a multilateral partner. And when we did that, what we did was to, you know, support the government's leadership to actually ensure that we crafted this program, ensured that we had the right policy, passed it through uh, the, the, the government, went to parliament and ensured that they were able to budget for it because they saw all the evidence. And it was based on that, that, you know, the World Bank, the AFDB and everyone else is now putting in their hand and investing in it because that's what brings the change that we want to see. When we were looking at um, uh, uh, bans, you know, export bans across the continent due to COVID, everyone started locking down. And rightly so, because the first thing the government wants to do is to feed its people, mm -hmm. not to go and, I mean, you want to feed your children before you feed your neighbor's children, right? <laughs> Um, not because you hate your neighbor's children, but because the priority is yours. Put your own face mask on first before you help the others. <laughs> so, you, so you, you know, um, uh, and, and when we looked at that, we discovered that a lot of these export bans decisions were, were made as knee-jerk uh, policy decisions. There was no evidence to back that up. So what did you do? We sat down, worked with these governments, quite a number of them, and today, I can give examples. You know, Zambia had locked its borders and said, no way, and all that. And it was because of certain key reasons. We reviewed the mm -hmm. reasons with them, provided the evidence. Today, Zambia has a policy of no export bans. If, but the policies are there. And that's because we want to improve po policy predictability. You know, I, I think it was Prof in the last panel who was talking about policy predictability. It's about making sure that even if there's going to be a ban, People know what is coming. The market can be prepared. Private sector can be prepared. And those who, uh, you know, uh, 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 for example, the Strategic Greens Reserve, Reserve can say, okay, look, to make sure that we deal with um, price vol volatility, we know when to release from the Strategic Greens Reserve, and we know when to buy out and store. I mean, these are Dr. some of the things. Dr. Yeah. You, you promised a story, and it's a good one. I even forgot my timekeeping duties and got caught up. I even have questions <laughs> for you, but I'm going to restrain myself and move on to Dr. Araba. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Manjur. Um, political systems, and I, and I don't think this is just for African countries, but political systems, by their very nature, are risk-averse. Um, We've seen governments rise to the pinnacle of power and fall off the back of policy failure. The challenge, as I see, is if you are supposed to be entrepreneurial in the public policy space, the punishment for getting it wrong is too steep. You know, startups are allowed to, you say, oh, yes, you know, 90% of startups fail, but can you say 90% of governments fail? I mean, you. You can't afford to fail. You have to get it right one time. It's almost impossible. It's an impossible ask. So we get countries or governments come out with policies. They can consult with stakeholders. But ultimately, what they're doing is making a macro experiment. It's an experiment. It's a leap of faith. So on, on how the consultations, you know, engagements, etc., happens, I think, governments just need all the help they can get. Let's, let's start there. Then the other thing on data is almost counterintuitively, the group that requires data the most isn't even the people designing policies. I don't think anyway. They're the advocates. They could be uh, the advocates in government, advocates in civil society, advocates in private sector, but they need that evidence. They need the data upon which to strengthen their arguments. As you understand, you know, for those who've worked in government or worked with government or even in private sector, if you're in a boardroom, you have to defend your ideas. You have to bring your, your case, you know, around your, your fellow directors. You have to fight for scarce resources, uh, whether in the public or private sector. 
Deve even development aid, which is why in some cases, and I hope my development partners will forgive me here, we say that, you know, donors are full of hubris. You know, they feel they know it all, and because they have the, the deep pockets, they are choosing winners. Um, but how do you influence them? You know, Dale Carnegie wrote the book, How to Win Friends and Influence People. You know, how, how, do, you, how do you influence people with the information? I don't think it's just, you know, civil society advocates. I think we need more advocates within each of these stakeholder groups. And one of the examples that I, that I want to give as I, as I wrap up is um, when uh, we were designing the National Agriculture Resilience Framework in Nigeria as a response to the 2012 floods. So the government, of course, had gone all gung-ho on the agriculture transformation agenda. Uh, jobs were being created, food was being produced. And then, you know, this climate shock hit us. Um, and we were completely unprepared. But fortunately for us, the floods came right at the tail end of the harvest season. So most of the crops had been harvested. So there was, disaster was averted, to, 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 you know, to, to, to say so. Um, so in response, the government then went on a massive um, engagement strategy uh, across the country to understand... Uh, you know, just like the mosques that uh, uh, Apollos mentioned, you know, the things that are counterintuitive, you don't expect that these are the incentives to get people to be on your side. As I talk about, you know, winning friends, you have to win friends. And so it's through these engagements, constant engagements, and we have a lot of data. I think, you know, I maybe push back a little on this lack of data uh, narrative. I mean, we, we have the AATM. I don't know it's, if it's been launched or it's been launched. Have we launched? It's launched, right. So we've got the AATM, we have all the think tanks, we have, we have a plethora of data. You've got Amazon, Google, Microsoft investing in large data gathering, data um, efforts across the continent and around the world now in agriculture. So I think it's how that information informs and strengthens the hands of these advocates. And again, when I say advocates, I'm not speaking exclusively and no disrespect to civil society actors. I think everybody should be an advocate. I think that's why we're in the AGRF. You know, once you step into this room, you don't wear your individual tribal hat. You are all here for agriculture. So it's, it's about how we strengthen our hand uh, and how we ensure that we, 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 we fight for the things that work, but also buy time for those ideas that require a long gestation period. And you don't, you don't allow good things to die. You know, we've talked about, you know, this long running debate of individual unique identifiers for people and the multiplier effect of that. If a government doesn't have enough time to embed that kind of idea and a new government comes in and, you know, just scraps it, that's the end of it. You need good ideas. You need to buy good ideas. You need, you need to buy time for good ideas. And the only way that happens is when your advocates have the information to support you. Thank you. 30 seconds. Again, the powers of our ancestors are upon you and in your hands. What would you do if you had all the power? Who would you be and what would you do to transform food systems from a governance perspective? Enjoy the power. It's only 30 seconds of power. <laughs> so I have the power. I shall use it fully for 30 seconds. Um, if I could be, I would be a female leader of a country and be a champion of transformation. So that's nothing else because that says... <laughs> I don't think I will be president of Mali anytime soon, but uh, getting there, I feel that it shows so many in, in, the, in the declaration, in the impact. Um, as I said, transformation needs a champion. Mm -hmm. So to be a champion, we've seen many champions and they have common faces. Um, sorry to say, they look like the gentleman in the room. So having a female champion in a country is not only driving new hopes, new momentum, but it also shows the commitment, the political will. That is not uh, very frequent in many of our African countries. I feel that it not only it's about changing food systems, but it's also about changing mentalities. We spoke about that earlier. Um, and a Muslim woman also. With all that brings, uh, being a Muslim woman, I see that what it means. It's the, the strong message that comes from it. We're in the right country, aren't we? 
Exactly. We are having this AGRF <laughs> at the right country, the right country, at the right moment. So if I had my wand, I would have many more of those. Many, In many Africa. more African women. Yes. Champion <laughs> and leading. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Yeah, I think if I had all the powers, yes. my passion is building resilience of the women and youth. So I will be looking for technologies that will build this resilient. What is it that we are lacking for our women, our youth, and everyone to be going hungry? So my uh, real passion is to build the resilience of the youth and the women, the communities. So because it's only for 30 seconds, I wish um, the people that are here who have the monies, if they can give me the monies so that I can go there and build the resilience of the youth and the uh, women in my community in Malawi. Thank you so much. And you know, with that 30 seconds, you had the money. Eh? So, so now, Apollos, you have the money and the power. Tell us. <laughs> No, I, I think um, um, just to you know, appreciate um, what's coming from uh, the, the female colleagues here, um, there are three things for me. One will be to ensure that there's a very clear strategic shift from demand-driven to data-driven decision-making. Because then you know that you're, you're, the, you're, you're, you're going to have you know, very little loss when you invest. Because these things boil down to investments. The second is that, you know, um, I would ensure, you know, um, a proper um, uh, uh, partnership that is driving for results, because that's what's important. We can't do it alone. So I will bring in all the partners that are required to make sure that we drive for results. And it's not going to be everyone doing their thing. I have a plan. I hold the power and the money. Here is my plan. If you can't line up behind my plan, the door is open. Ah, that is proper power. Yeah, that's proper power. You because only had 30 <laughs> seconds of it, though. <laughs> and, fi <laughs> and, and finally, finally is to ensure that we are accountable. Because at the end of the day, if we're not accountable, we can't measure results. But now I give you all the power and then you want to be accountable. Yeah. That's the exact opposite of having unlimited power. The beauty of power is to be accountable for it. Oh, beautiful, beautiful. That's deep. <laughs> Dr. Araba. Yep. Um, I think for 30 seconds, right? So. <laughs> and 10 of them are gone already. Oh, yeah. I know, I know, I know. Well, I, I have to say, I, I, I think it's, it's important for us to. Um, see ourselves as stakeholders in this pros prosperity narrative, mm -hmm. first of all. And we need to have a clear vision of what success looks like. Everybody working together on this. It must be multi-stakeholder uh, inclusive, but also intergenerational. So we're not sort of yielding the floor to say, oh, it's for the youth or it's for older people. Everybody is involved and every stakeholder is involved. So I think a clear idea of what success looks like and also maybe giving, giving, giving the room for those who dream big. We need dreamers, more dreamers in the room. Uh, and we need, to, <laughs> and we, need to give, we need to give them the platform. You know, unfortunately, our society tends to isolate and ostracize dreamers. We need to give dreamers the floor because they're mm -hmm. either going to save us or destroy us all. I'm hoping they save us. Um, if, if, they, if they're going to save us, you know, the same types of dreams that took mankind to the moon, the same kind of dreamers who have taken a lunar lander from, from India to the moon now, are the same types of dreamers who will indeed usher in this true agriculture transformation in Africa. Thank you. And with those visions, those aspirations, join me in extending a round of applause to our speakers. I thank you. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much for your attention, for the gift of engaging with us in these important conversations. I think a lot has been said, a lot of wisdom and knowledge has been shared, and hopefully a community of, of 
thinkers is building around this policy um, engagement conversation. Again, my name is Wanjiro Kamar Rutenberg, and it has been an honor and a pleasure to hold this space for us today. Thank you.